because they help us learn every day and they cook the best food. Moms are special because they give us unconditional love. Moms are important because they care no matter what. I think moms are cool because they're always taking care of us. Moms are awesome because they are nice. Moms are special because they care for us. Moms are special because they help us grow. Moms are special because they care about us. Moms are special because they help us do really hard things. Moms are awesome because they help us do our homework. And they sometimes do our chores. Moms are special because they help us whenever we need them. Moms are special because whenever we're in a bad situation, they come and comfort us. Moms are special because they are our moms and they love us. And they also take care of us. Moms are special because they love us. Moms are awesome because they take care of the children, love their children, and miss them when they're away. Moms are awesome because they play with their children and they um, make them feel better when they're sad. Moms are awesome because they feed people and, and moms are awesome because they have lunch with together and and sometimes have milkshakes and and chocolate milk. Moms are awesome because they're funny and they're kind, they're beautiful, they serve others, and they're just the greatest superheroes in all the land. Mothers are the best because they love you no matter what. And they give hugs, kisses, and snuggles whenever you want them. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day, DMC.
upon you in a thousand generations your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children
Granger Missionary Church, and a special Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. You know, we love you moms. You are the best. We could not be here without you. Moms are extremely important um, because, moms, you are God's plan for the care and for the nurture of children. Not only that, but you are on the front lines of discipleship in your home. You know, you are the ones who, for the most part, have the, the, uh, are the source of God's command, which it says in Deuteronomy 6, These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Moms, others can do that. We as a church, we can do that, but no one can do it like you, Mom. We can support you, and that's our role here as a church, is to support you as a mom, as a family, in your discipleship of your children. We don't take the place of mom. There's nothing like mom. I'm the recipient of a godly mom, and I'm so thrilled that my children have a godly mom. You know, the greatest thing that you can do, Mom's, for your children is to learn to live as a child of God. You see, moms, as you learn to obey your heavenly Father, your children learn what obedience is. Moms, as you lean in to the love that only God can give, your children learn and see what it means to trust Moms, as as you find your beauty, as you find your identity, as you find your purpose and your value in who God says you are, apart from what the world says you are, your children will learn to draw their identity, their value, and their worth from God as well. So moms, you have an important role. And we just know that we here at Granger Missionary Church 
we support you. We want to support you. We are praying for you. We are cheering you on because no one can do it like you, Mom. And I recognize that for today, most of people are, are celebrating today with a sentiment of, of motherhood and joy and those sorts of things. But we, I also want to recognize there are some that for today is a day filled with um, sorrow. Uh, it's filled with loss. It's filled with regret. Today's reminder of a child you've lost or of decisions you've made that have damaged your ability to be a mom. So we recognize that. And we're praying for you. And today's passage, today's message is going to be a message of hope for you because I want you to watch as we walk through this passage. I want you to watch and see how Jesus seeks out a woman who through her own actions and through the judgment of the world uh, around her, seeing her circumstances and labeling her, uh, uh, they, they see her as an outsider, as, as different, as used, as a broken, as worthless. And I want you to see how Jesus seeks out this woman, how he sits with her, how he fulfills the desires that she's longing for and redirects her heart's focus, how he gives her new purpose as a woman, and how she, at least in this story, how she accomplishes more for the gospel and for God's kingdom than the 12 men who were called to that very purpose. So let's get started. I'm going to give us a running start into our passage today in John. If you remember where we've been um, we were uh, in, in John chapter 2, at the very end of John chapter 2, we, we talked about how uh, verses 24 and 25, where it said that Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, meaning the people, because he knew all people. It says he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. We said that was going to kind of be our lens as we looked through the next several stories, as it, it, it gave us the picture that Jesus was going to expose the hearts of those those he was going to meet in order to transform their hearts through his message of the kingdom of God and the gospel. And so we saw that at, the, at one of our first encounters with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the religious elite. Uh, he was a leader of the Jews, and he came to Jesus by night, kind of under the cover of darkness. He was curious about who Jesus was. He wanted to know what Jesus was about. He thought Jesus might have something for him to get closer to God, and Jesus exposes his heart and said, it's not about trying to reach God through any external religious means. It's through an internal change of our very heart such that we're transformed. You could even call it being born again. And as we remember, Nicodemus wasn't ready at that moment to make that leap. He wasn't sure. Jesus came to the religious elite. And so we're going to see then uh, that Jesus moves from the religious elite to going to the other end of the spectrum in our passage today. But in John chapter 3, we saw how Jesus um, um, gave us one of those, or, or the John gave us one of the, the greatest Bible verses, uh, the most famous Bible verse probably of all time, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, for the first century Jew, I wonder what they thought of as they heard that God so loved the world. In their mind, I wonder if they, if they were thinking that, well, of course, the Jewish world. God so loves the Jews that he would give his only son. That would make sense. Or maybe they were challenged to think, well, God, only, God loves whoever would be religious, the Jews and those who would take on the Jewish faith. They could see God loving so much that world that he would give his son. But I wonder if they had in mind what Jesus really meant and what, uh, what Jesus really came to do, which was to love the whole world, everyone, Jew and non-Jew. And that's what today's story is about. It's an actual picture of how God loves the whole world so much that he would send Jesus for us. John chapter 4 shows this. Looking at John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says this, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. 
It says in verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. So I, I want to just stop there for a moment, get a picture of where Jesus is and what he's doing. So Jesus is in the south. He's down by Jerusalem, and he's going to travel north through the country up to Galilee, where he's from. But in order to do that, he would have to move about uh, 70 miles due north. And that would take him through an area of the country called Samaria. Now, um, to give you a little history with the Samaritans, uh, they were a group of people, if we remember back in our Jewish history, um, right after King, King David came, his son King Solomon, after Solomon's reign, then the, the nation of Israel was split into two, with the, the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And both of them went through this period of, of following God and not following God. Uh, Israel had no good kings or kings that followed after God. The people continually rebelled against God, followed the idols, uh, incorporated the gods of the people around them. So the prophets, if you remember, were this, during this time telling the people to repent or judgment would come. And indeed, in 722 BC, the Assyrians from the east came, conquered the northern nation, the northern kingdom of Israel, and scattered them, taking from the the people of Israel the best back to Assyria and sending Assyrians into the northern uh, area to settle the land and to mix with the Jews that were left. And so those that were left began to mix with religion and, and intermarry such that the Jews in the south and later after their captivity, the Jews would, would always see those Samaritan people as the half-breeds. They were part Jewish, part Assyrian, and nobody really liked them. They were the half-breeds. They were seen as unclean. And so if you were a strict uh, law-abiding Jew, and if you needed to go from the south to the north, instead of traveling through the area of Samaria, where you yourself might become ceremonial un- ceremonially unclean, you might opt to take the circuitous route around Samaria. Now, that might double your trip from a three-day trip to a six or even more day trip, but you might cross over to the east, cross the Jordan River, travel north, and then cross west again into the area of northern um, Israel, Galilee, those sorts of places which were still distinctly Jewish. But it says here, interestingly, in verse 4, that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, whether that meant that Jesus just had, if he was going to go north, he had to go through the area of Samaria, but, or perhaps maybe something deeper is happening here. And I, th- I think that's the case. Because given the, the picture of the story we have and the, the, the hint that the reason this story is happening is to show the picture that God so loved the world and this is how much, it seems that Jesus is acting as he typically does with God's purpose at heart. You see, Jesus is motivated for, with God's purpose. And so he, in order to accomplish God's purpose, he had to go into Samaria. Jesus had to enter the mess for the sake of the message. Really, that's the story of Jesus. I mean, think about it. Jesus entered the mess for you and me. Jesus was creator. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus was in heaven, the place we long to be and we don't even know what it's really like. And there he was, and he looked down and he saw you and me in rebellion against him. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. While we were in rebellion against him, wanted nothing to do with him, we were a mess, sitting in our own filth, thinking that somehow that was going to make us happy. And yet Jesus came and entered that mess. He had to. God so loved the world, so loved the world that even in our filth and even in our mess, Jesus entered it. And this is a picture of it right here. Where others would avoid, Jesus walks into. Jesus is willing to enter the mess for the gospel message. Here's the difficult part, though. You and me who are followers of Jesus, that means if as we follow our leader, as we follow uh, the example for our lives, as he enters into the mess, He calls us to enter into the mess. So, I don't know about you, but there's probably somebody in your life, somebody in my life, at least one, who we would consider a mess. Someone that we would just as soon avoid, someone we'd just rather walk around, someone we 
Um, we think to ourselves, their sin got them there. So that's on them. It's a consequence of their sin. That's why they are the way they are. That's why they're unclean. That type of person, if I'm seen with that person, do you know what others will think about me? I would just as soon stay, they annoy me. They're irritating. And you know what? When they're ready to get cleaned up, when they're ready to deal with that, when they look over here and see the good things that are happening over here and they're ready to clean up, then maybe I'll step in. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus entered in. Matter of fact, it said he had to. He was being led by God's purpose to enter in. As we walk a Jesus first life, as we're followers of Jesus, we're called to enter into people's messes for the sake of the gospel message. Jesus not only enters into the mess, realizes that it's part of God's purpose, but I don't want us to ever think that Jesus cheated. You know, that he somehow could lean on his godness while we have to deal with our humanness. It just, just notice what it says in verse 5. It says, uh, um, so he came, Jesus came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. It's, uh, Jacob's well was there. And so, listen, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. So it, we're, it, we have this little interesting fact here that says that Jesus was wearied. He was about 40 miles into his journey to get to the place um, that we know of as Sikar, and he was tired. It was about the sixth hour, which would have been about noon. He's traveling in the desert. The dude's tired. We, we follow a Christ who is the Son of God, but he was also a man. And so as he enters the mess, he's feeling it. He's going to feel it. He's weary, but for traveling towards the mess. You know, as we travel and enter into people's messes, we might feel weary. We might feel it. Jesus felt it too. That's no excuse not to enter into the mess to reach people for the gospel. Jesus was, all, was led by God's purpose, but he also lived in a human context. Jesus entered into the mess. Jesus knows that you can be wearied while working in the mess. And it says that it was about the sixth hour, and as he's there by this well, it says, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This woman got it. She understood the context. She understood who she was, and she could see who Jesus was. And Jesus honors her. You see, Jesus is always doing these things that are uh, uh, breaking uh, um, um, our, our preconceived ideas about how the world should work in order that he might install into us the values of the kingdom. He's breaking barriers to show the love of God goes not just to the religiously elite and then down to everybody else, but it, it, it penetrates the entire world. So much so that he would enter into the mess just to honor this woman. And it, we already read in chapter two that he already knows all about her. She doesn't know that yet, but he knows all about her, and yet he honors her. You see, the surprise of Jesus speaking to this woman is not lost on her. She recognizes how many barriers Jesus just broke in order to not just speak to her, but ask her for a drink. You see, first of all, she's a woman. And so Jewish men during that day uh, were, were not allowed or told not allowed to even speak to a woman that, in public unless they were related to her. That's, how, that's the, how low women were viewed in the first century A.D., that Jewish men were not even to speak to them. Matter of fact, they were told not even to go out into public if they didn't have to. They were, they were there simply to bear children and keep the house. But Jesus honors this woman by asking her for a drink. And beyond that, we know that this woman showed up at noon. And she showed up alone at noon. Now, it, during that time in the desert, you wouldn't show up at noon to draw water. You, first of all, you don't need water at noon more than you need it in the morning. That's when you need the water. Second of all, the, the typical flow was that women would, would gather together and go out early in the morning when it was still cool in the day to gather the water they need for the day. But for some reason, and, and we get a hint of it later, this woman is not coming uh, when everybody else is coming. She's coming later perhaps because she's not welcome. We have hints later that 
she doesn't live an exemplary lifestyle, and so she's most likely an outcast, seen as an outsider, understood to be a sinner. And so she shows up at noon alone, and Jesus speaks to her. Beyond that, she's a Samaritan. And we already said about how the Jews don't like Samaritans. They would completely avoid them. And she recognizes he's a Jew, and she knows she's a Samaritan. When, and they always would, if they spoke to them at all, if a Jew were to speak to a Samaritan at all, it would be um, to ridicule them or to, to, to look down on them. And then yet Jesus is asking something of her. And beyond that, she asks Jesus for a drink. You see, Jewish law said that you couldn't share utensils with a Samaritan or you yourself would become unclean. I want you to see the stark contrast. Even beyond that, we know who Jesus is. So here we have Jesus, who's a Jew, and this woman who's a Samaritan. We have Jesus, who's a male rabbi, one that should follow the law according to the Jews very strictly, and we have a common woman to whom Jesus just spoke. Beyond that, we have this woman that we know from later in the story, is a sinner. And then we have Jesus, who is the embodiment of holiness, the Son of God, speaking to her. You know, it was kind of easy as we were back in chapter 3 of Jesus, perhaps thinking of Jesus uh, of saving Nicodemus, you know, the religious guy who looks good, who's been following and chasing after God. We understand how Jesus could save him and reach out to him and find a way to save him, but, but this woman... This woman who's not even looking for him and is currently living in sin and is someone who doesn't even have an inkling of who he is, yet Jesus is seeking her out and asking her for a drink. And that's because the gospel, the gospel crosses every barrier. We need to remember that. The gospel crosses every barrier. I think at times we, we say that, we teach that, we think that, but I wonder if we pray that and we live that that we really believe that the gospel can, can reach anyone. Or if, we, if we're honest, really, really honest, do we really think that there are some people that are just too far? They're too far gone. We look at how they're living their life. We look at the way that they don't want anything to do with Jesus at this moment, and we've, we've maybe backed off on praying about for them. We've just stopped. Or maybe we just don't even like those kind of people. What it, you fill in the blank. But if we're honest... I think at this moment, what this passage needs to reveal in us is the prejudice that comes out in our own heart that somehow we were more deserving of the gospel than the people that Jesus came to save. But we need to see in this picture that the gospel breaks every barrier to show that God so loved the world he gave his only son. Not just for the religious, not for the clean not for just those who go to church or can speak church or pray or give, but Jesus came because God so loved the world that he wanted to reach the outcast, those who weren't even seeking him yet. There's no one so far from the gospel. There's no barrier too big that the gospel can't breach, and Jesus can't meet and transform them. I think sometimes we just rather stick to our own little bubbles, our own little barriers, our own little circles, our own little social areas and stay clean rather than actually seeking out mess and those in it so that they can be one for the gospel. Jesus gets it. I mean, she hasn't even met Jesus yet. I mean, she doesn't know who Jesus is. We do. She doesn't. But she was so surprised by this Jewish man speaking to her in a kind way that she stays to hear his message. I think there's a truth in there for, for us. Perhaps there's someone that if we would just give a kind word to, if we would just take some time if we would just go and seek out, there, is, there are so many lonely people, people who feel themselves so far from God that there's no way they can reach God or that they ever could get to God, that they just simply need someone who knows Jesus to bring Jesus to them and explain how God so loves the world that he sent Jesus. Just a kind word, just a prayer, just time spent with might be the open door to give the message of the gospel. 
It's Jesus here. Jesus reaches out to the outcast, this woman, to bring her in. He offers the gospel. He offers to her what is really needed. I mean, after this, this, this encounter, what does Jesus do when, when, when he's confronted or he sees this woman who's the opposite by in many respects, contrasted to him? And, and she's, uh, uh, he asks her for a drink, and then he wants to give her something when she questions him. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He has given us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. You see, there's something funny happening here. Jesus is is a master of using metaphor to, to communicate spiritual truths. And so this woman is thinking physically that Jesus is trying to offer her now water and not just a water that's drawn from a well, but living water, a spring of water. And she's thinking, this is great. If I could just have that, I could have water at home and I wouldn't have to come out here to the well at noon every time. And Jesus is saying, no, more than just thinking physically how this might cure your immediate area of shame, I want to give you something so real, so deep, that it will satisfy the thirst of your soul so that shame won't even be a thing for you anymore. That's what Jesus is getting at. And I think it's interesting how Jesus uses the term living water. He says, I want to give you, what does he say, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. See, there's, there was three types of ways of, of gathering water during that day. There was the, the well that this woman was at, and, and as she said, how are you going to get something from the well? You need to drop something down into this bucket, and you need uh, a bucket or something down into this well, and you need to draw up the water. Or the other option was a cistern, a, way, uh, a place in the ground where you you would gather or, or, or a container in which you would gather water as it rained or, or however it would, it would come into the container, but you would have to gather it. And it would have seasons of being drier and more filled, but there, there's a difference between those two options and, and a spring. You see, a spring, you can't stop. It has its own source of water, and it keeps welling up no matter how much you try to stop. You see, the first two options require something of you this, the third option, the, the, the spring of life that Jesus wants to give is something that doesn't even need you. See, the source of living water that Jesus wants to give is given through the Holy Spirit. It, it's a work of the Spirit, not anything we do. She was drawing from things to try to fill and satisfy the thirst of her soul, the deep longings. We'll find out later it was through relationships. She had already had five husbands, and the one she was living with was not her husband. She was trying to use relationships to, to fill in the cistern, to try to satisfy the thirst of her soul. And Jesus says, I want to give you something more. But here's the truth. We look at this woman, and we see the sadness of, of her situation, but the truth is we are the Samaritan woman. Woman. We are that woman. We all have a longing, a desire in the very soul of our, of our lives that is drawing from this world that which we think will satisfy through relationships, through things, through um, um, identity, through labels, through fame, through all sorts of different things where we're trying to satisfy and fill up our buckets in our lives to somehow satisfy us, not recognizing that through Jesus, Through the gospel, we can have that which satisfies our soul in this life and gives us eternal life in the next. Jesus came to give living water, water that is continually flowing, not from a source we have to draw from, but from him who is the very source of that water and source of that life. And the problem is, after we, I, I, I struggle with this, that after many of us have, have, have given our lives to Christ and we have that, that spring within us, I think so many of us walk away from the spring 
And even though we have the spring of life in us, we're trying to draw from other cisterns and other wells. Even though we have Christ in our life, we're still looking to relationships. We want Christ and that relationship will satisfy. Christ and this amount of money will satisfy. Christ and this job or this title or this thing will somehow satisfy. And this is not just unique to us here in America or here in the 21st century. The Jews wrestled with this so much so that through Jeremiah, God called his people people to stop trying to gather things to satisfy their soul when he alone was there to satisfy. Jeremiah 2, it says, for my people, my people, God's people have committed two evils. He says, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Brothers and sisters, there is no cistern, there is no well that we can create, that we can draw from, that will ultimately satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. It didn't before we know Christ, it's not gonna do it after we know Christ. We need to stop trying to fill those broken cisterns. We need to call others who don't yet have the living water to know who Jesus is so that they can be satisfied. We, brothers and sisters, need to start being satisfied on Christ alone. Stop trying to fill up on other things the world may offer. The problem is, we're situated, if, if we're honest, we're situated in a culture, in a time, in a day, in an age that's full of glistening, glistening little puddles. You're not going to satisfy for very long, if at all. Yet we chase in them, we jump in them, we play in them, we think somehow that's going to satisfy. Brothers and sisters, it's not going to satisfy. Only Jesus is the spring. And once, once we become and we understand how to draw from that source and that source alone, we will be satisfied completely. We won't need those other things in the world. Because what's really, what's really going on here is not anything to do with water. It's not anything to do with relationships, external and earthly. It's really a heart problem. See, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. That, that's always what Jesus gets to. It's always what he's exposing in us is the heart of the problem, which is the problem of the heart. And ultimately, the problem is worship. So let me ask you, where are you in this story? All of us need to sit with Jesus. I mean, the message of Jesus' encounter with the woman of Samaria is for those of you who feel that you are far beyond the reach of Jesus. Maybe it's shame, guilt, addiction, fear, hurt, pain. Uh, maybe you feel like you're just in a mess, but there's something that, that's in between you and Jesus, and you feel like you're just far beyond the reach of Jesus. This story shows that you are not too far for Jesus to enter into your mess and meet you where you are. You are loved by Jesus. Your identity, your value, your worth is found more with Jesus who will sit with you than it is in anybody or anything else that sits around you. Find it with Jesus. You are not beyond his reach. And for those that you love and you know that, that others have said or, or you may feel are far beyond the reach of Jesus, know that they are not beyond the reach. Pray for them. Ask God to send someone to enter into their mess. The story is also for those who feel that they are far beyond the need of Jesus. For those who feel that they don't need this Jesus, that they're fine with the empty cisterns or they're filling up their cisterns with what the world has to offer, but they will run dry. This story shows us that we all have a deep longing in our hearts for the living water that only Jesus can give. And so this story is for those who feel that they are far beyond the need of Jesus. You need Jesus. You need to let Jesus expose in your heart those things that will not satisfy so that he can give you what he will, can ultimately satisfy as the longing of your heart. And finally, this story shows us that it is for those who feel that they are far beyond the use of Jesus. 
for those of you who feel that, that you can be used because of where you've been or, or what uh, you've done or what you're in right now. Know that if you just come and sit with Jesus, let Him expose your heart, confess your sin, let Him make you clean, you will have a story of how God has worked within you. It was never about you anyway. It's about what God can do in you and through you for others to see who God is so that they can know that God so loved the world that He gave His Son. There are people that only you can reach. You are not beyond the use of of Jesus, because you can be effective for the kingdom if you just let Jesus in. So for each of us, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Sit with Him. Let Him expose what needs to be exposed. Let Him fill what needs to be filled. Let Him show you how to become a true worshiper of the great I Am, and then let Him send you to those so that you can declare to a world through your life that God so loved the world He gave His only Son for them. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for sending Jesus into our mess, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we, we confess that even now as we, as we, those of us who have trusted in Christ, that we still at times run to these cisterns to fill them up with what the world has to offer, knowing or maybe not realizing that they will eventually run dry. Lord, forgive us for neglecting the spring of water. Help us to return, sit with you. Lord, I pray for all of those in the sound of this voice who need to come to you today. They're in a mess. And they need you to sit with them. They need to know that you love them. That you want to be in the mess with them. To draw them out. By calling them to true worship. By giving their lives to you, Jesus. That they can be made whole. That they can be made filled. That they can be clean. And that they can have a story to tell. Father, we thank you for so loving the world that you gave your son in whose name we pray. Amen. time.